Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Althea Walker. I am the Tribal Climate Science Liaison for the American Indian Higher Education Consortium at the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center. And I will be hosting today's um, session um, in which we have uh, representatives from tribes from across the Southwest. And I will ask them to go ahead and introduce themselves. So we will start with Shasta. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Althea. I'm excited to be a part of this group today. I am the Environmental Director and the Historic Preservation Officer for the Paula Band of Mission Indians, which is located in San Diego County, California. And Sharon? Hi, I'm Sharon Hausen. I'm the Planning Program Manager for the Pueblo of Laguna, which is located west of Albuquerque in New Mexico. And next we have John. Hello, I'm John C. Parada, Environmental Coordinator for the Augustine Band of Kauai Indians in the Coachella Valley, Southern California. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Lisa Gilver. I'm the Director of the Campo Environmental Protection Agency. I've been at Campo for several years now, again, and I'm glad to be with you. Thank you, Althea. And Cynthia? Good afternoon, everybody. Cynthia Naha, Director of Natural Resources for the Santa Domingo Pueblo here in New Mexico. And I am from the Hopi tribe, and I'm also Tewa and Ihantuan Dakota Oyate. Thank you for allowing me to be here. And Corwin. Hello, my name is Corwin Carroll. I'm half White Mountain Apache, half Navajo. I'm a, currently an intern with the BIA Pathways Program. And I'm an undergrad at the University of Arizona. Yate, she a Nikki Kuli in the Shia. Can you only know Shlon look at the Nah, a Bashish chin, is a Tlana e Dashinale, Tua head lini e Dashinche. Shant Tua de do bestowed is the Shkij de a Nasha. I would away the net son in the Shlem. Hi, my name is Nikki Kuli, and this is how I always introduce myself to anyone as a Navajo woman. I am from Blue Gap and Shanto, Arizona on the Nebikeya, Navajo land. I am of the Tower House clan and I am born for the Reed People clan. My maternal grandparents are of the Water That Flows Together clan. Paternal grandparents are of the Many Goats clan. And I am one of the program managers for the Tribes and Climate Change program that's housed within the Institute for Tribal Environmental Professionals. Uh, the first question that I have for you today is, what does climate resiliency mean to you? I'm happy to start. Climate resiliency to me means a lot of things. Of course, it means survival, the ability to survive in this new world in which we find ourselves. But beyond survival, you can, you can survive, but resiliency means surviving well. So, Resiliency means that you can you can take what's coming and you can bend with it and adapt to it and be flexible to the new experiences so that when the difficult times pass, you can come back just as strong, if not stronger, than you were before. So resiliency is more than survival. Resiliency is surviving and strengthening when the crisis has passed. I don't think that I can um, can add a whole lot to what Shasta said because I agree with, with that entirely, but I think the word that came to mind also for me in the, the tribal context was really persistence um, and just the ability to continue to move forward under all kinds of circumstances. Um, and that does include changing and adapting, which I know we're going to talk about also, um, but not just survival, but long-term survival through a very wide range of, of changes over time. All right, that leaves me. <laughs> okay, for me, resiliency. What does resiliency mean to me? Um, well, it depends how you look at it, you know, and when we look at it as, as life, 
and our normal actions, the way we live day to day, it, it's an ability to recover or adjust easily to adversity or change. Uh, it's the ability to overcome challenges, you know, whether it's trauma, tragedy, personal crisis, everyday life problems, you know, uh, and we bounce back stronger, wiser, and more powerful. Um, sorry with the ums. I know I hope you can cut those out. It's, it's also figuring out a strategy that works for us in everyday modern life. When you, now when I refer to climate change, resilient could mean strengthening the ability of human and non-human systems to accept and respond to changes in the Earth's climate. Uh, example would be sustainable building strategies serve as a cornerstone for enhancing resilience, fire, increased temperatures, extreme heat events, extreme freezing events, high winds, all weather. Being resilient and having a house that can withstand and, and give you a lifetime to live in versus having to repair it, you know, three years, five years versus where we get 10 to 15 years out of our homes before they need drastic improvements. I had one more thing. Resilient building must be resistant to expected natural disasters, climate impacts, flooding, as I mentioned, winds, earthquakes, tsunamis, wildland fires, landslides, everything that is generated by the climate and the variables. For me, like when I think about resiliency, I think about like our like my ancestors and like my grandparents, like especially like through education, they taught us like the importance of education. And like my mom, they put, put my mom through boarding school. And so up to this point, like, I feel like I'm continuing that by continuing my education at the University of Arizona. And so in that aspect, I feel that's resilient for Native Americans to continue their education. Thank you. This is Lisa. Um, I'd like to continue in that vein. I think uh, education is particularly important. It is, is, is in my family. I've got a lot of educated, a lot of educated Indians in my family and, I, and I'm very proud of that. What uh, I, to build on to that is uh, staying informed and keeping informed about the, uh, about the issues, particularly climate that, that, doesn't, that doesn't discriminate that will have a profound and lasting impact on every single one of us. It's one of the things that that does. In fact, it has a lot to do with who we are each as individual Indians and the tribes that we uh, come from. I'm Pawnee and Comanche. I didn't say that in the earlier um, discussion, but I work for a, a tribe in uh, uh, Kumeyaay people in uh, south of California. And who we are, each of the different uh, our bands our peoples um, uh, have a climate-based um, uh, identity, I think, and, and we, we practice our culture, our ceremony, our, our things, our songs have to do very much with what's going on around us in the bigger picture. And, and so I appreciate that uh, the, the young man starting off with the education um, and it goes on. Whether or not it's formal in an institution or not, we continue to educate ourselves. So thank you for, for, for allowing me to play off of that, of your, of your uh, choice. Hey guys, so when I think of what resiliency means to me, you know, I think about the generations that are here today that followed our ancestors and the work that we're trying to establish as far as <clears throat> understanding, if you will, the technical terminology and aspects of what climate change is. Um, I've, that when I first inherited the grant that we have from BIA to do our adaptation plan, I struggled with the whole concept of, okay, well, what is climate change? Uh, when in my younger days, when I was heavily involved in grassroots organizing with Black Mesa Water Coalition, you know, we talked about climate justice, you know, what that means to us as indigenous peoples of you know Turtle Island or Mother Earth or you know however you see fit to recognize our land that we come from. So I, I struggled as far as you know when I talk about resiliency, how do I explain it from that climate scientist perspective to my community that I work for in Santa Domingo to elder, elderly uh, Kiwa women who speak a lot of primarily Keras, if you will, and understanding that 
you know, how do these words translate into charis to really develop that meaning and that context in which we're striving to build relationships and understanding, you know, the feeling of drought, the, the, the impact from wildfire, what, what flooding does to our homes and what it does to our land when we have poor soils, you know, because of overgrazing. So when I look at the concept of resiliency, it's me being here today learning about what it is in regards to adaptation that we must learn to develop a plan for, but it's beyond just planning. It's already looking at those actions and strategies that we've, so to speak, been implementing since who knows how long, generations upon generations ago, and that knowledge that is shared orally, and now a lot of things are being transcribed and written to still be able to keep that word and to keep that meaning and the essence of who we are, as Lisa said, from the respective tribes that we come from, from Hopi, from Pawnee, you know, from Autumn, Autumn land, you know, and even Apache. So all across, you know, the nation and Turtle Island in itself, you know, looking and recognizing that resiliency is our generation of today working to understand not only what it means to be resilient, but what it means to have that climate hope. And as we build our capacity to better understand what these mid and end of century projections mean, or what it means when you have your prior and paramount water stored in a reservoir in northern New Mexico called El Vado, and during dry spells like we're experiencing now, you get a lot of transpiration that causes loss of water, and then it decreases the amount of irrigable <laughs> water that you can use to irrigate your field for our Pueblo agriculturalist, you know. So even understanding the dynamics of how that all works in relationship to the work that we're trying to do as far as implementation of strategies that have been in, in, in an existence since our ancestors' time to our generation today to what we'll leave behind for the next seventh generation is what I see as climate hope as well as, you know, utilizing what seventh generation fund uses as a motto is how do we in this day and age be a good ancestors for the next generations to come. So to me, that's how it sort of works, you know, sort of like that, you know, the system of reciprocity, we're not just taking, but we're giving back and we have to find that balancedness of how we approach this with our local knowledge, our traditional knowledge with Western science and carving that path not only as our ancestors did, but what we'll do for the next seven generations to come. So along those lines um, of resiliency and what that means to you and the community that you work for, the tribe that you work for, um, but also thinking about um, climate hope. And, you know, in the last you know, maybe two years, you know, we've heard a lot of that, especially in the tribal spaces. Um, and people sharing, um, rather than looking at climate change, climate impacts as, you know, this negative, um, you know, looking at it as a, as a positive and, and, you know, what's the positivity that we get out of, you know, the changes that we're seeing due to climate. Um, so um, to you, um, what is climate hope? And um, how do you define that in the work that you're doing and from um, the experience that you've had in the work that you're doing? So the nice thing about going first is that you can steal other people's answers. <laughs> um, so I've been thinking a lot about climate hope uh, because sometimes it's hard to, to feel hope in these circumstances, but you're right. We have this tendency to focus a lot on the negatives and how bad things could get as opposed to what are some of the, you know, the so-called silver linings. And for me, working in a tribal community, but also working with my colleagues like yourselves in other spaces with other tribes or with, with tribal facing agencies and, and academia, universities, what have you. The hope I see is that it's building community and it's building a type of community that I don't know we would have formed if we weren't faced with a crisis that affects all of us. So I think it's brought us out of what tends to be this kind of Western and colonized vision of individualism and made us see that some of the things that we've lost over time in this new world that we live in, where we focus more on the individual than we do on community has been a mistake. So my hope 
for the work that we do is that we see solutions in coming together as communities rather than continuing down this path of just what's in it for me and maybe just my immediate friends and family. We need to visualize ourselves as hoping for a global community that is adapted to a new life and new ways of being at one with one another and also at one with our planet. And to me, that's that's the hope because I'm seeing that happen, not just in climate change, but in a lot of the other social issues like justice and equity for communities of color that we're seeing happen in the United States and I think all over the world. So that gives me hope. For me, when I think about climate hope, I think of it as being grounded in, in the community and in the community's knowledge of its own roots and a, you know, a, a refocusing on that um, and a recognition again a more constant recognition of the community strength um, in the, the Pueblo of Laguna where I work. And so it's always been there, that hope, and this also relates to the persistence and the resilience, um, but it's being articulated more perhaps now with climate change that the people will continue. Um, and so that's that's a source of hope within the community, but being able to work with the community as it's expressing that um, as it's talking about how important traditional practices are um, and the you know ways of continuing those is really hopeful for me also. All right. For me, climate hope it's an it's an invitation to explore another path. You know, I, I've worked for many tribes, and I've, I've drafted up two climate change adaptation plans. And as each tribe is unique and different, priorities are different, you, you have to be able to adapt not just to, like I said, everyday life things, you know. So in this, it, it, it opens up those opportunities for me to try and shine a little bit, even more than I, than I, than I do normally. Um, and not to brag, I, I like to shine. Um, it's a way to build our spiritual, physical, mental, and emotional resilience so that we are able to engage with climate reality from a place of resilience and product productivity. You know, many of us have difficulty in processing emotional intensity of living through this time, especially right now during COVID-19. You know, this is this has just turned the whole world around for me and my family. Um, but then again, I've taught my girls, you know, hey, we're not giving up, you know, there was fear. There was fear at the beginning of this. And my poor kids, I had to build their hope. And, and you know, that's gotta be the hardest thing because when your kids see you stressed and worried and, and trying to resolve issues, it, it, it carries on to them, you know? So living in denial and being overwhelmed, it's difficult. It doesn't allow us to be present and flourish with the gift of our own lives. Neither does it help us engage with problems or to build solutions. And, and when I say being present, it's having the mind completely engaged and appreciatively connecting with wherever the body is at that point, where we are, what we're doing, how we're doing it, and being fully into it, not being sidetracked on our phone while we're in meetings, you know, texting away, Facebooking away, you know, hey, I'll admit it, I do it sometimes, but that's, that's taking yourself out of being present. We gotta live for the moment, you know, do what we can, keep the hope. Um, so, you know, as we're talking about resiliency and hope within our communities that we work for um, and in, um, you know, what does that look like? Um, what does tribal climate adaptation look like, you know, through your lens, within your community? Um, maybe provide us um, an example or two of of what's taken place to build resiliency and hope in your community. I'll lead. Can I start with this one? <laughs> I did my homework, guys. I, I, I kind of prepared myself for this because I didn't want, I, I carry on a lot. You know how I am. So I was hoping to stay on track here. This, this, this one made me think too much. Um, Tribal adaptation as an adapting to tribal customs, beliefs, traditions, methods, and to survive 
and accept change during modernization. Um, man, it made me think. It made me spin. But, you know, from my experiences in life, I've noticed many old ways are still existent. In some instances, they have been modernized. This is where I'm on both sides of sharing tribal adaptation, mitigation, native or traditional methods. Non-natives and or deniers can make attempts to discredit these methods, mainly due to the fact because they're not modernized, that it's not their idea. When in fact, old ways for environmental management have been proven to be very effective. We all know this. It, it reminds me of when, when I was a grave digger. I started grave digging at a young age, 16, when I was in Rincon. And I was, I was just the young guy, the one that, that they really worked, you know, and, and put you in the hole and, and you did everything, you did everything. You, you cleaned, you dug, you used the pick, you used the bar, you used the hammer. Wow, it was an experience, you know, and, and the first thing I thought of was, I, I asked, why don't we try this? I made a suggestion. <laughs> and, and as we all know, when you come to, the, to a traditional event or something like that, whether it's a funeral, a wake, a gathering, or whatever it may be, suggestions sometimes aren't taken from outsiders, you know, um, or someone who's not familiar with the ways. And, and the first thing I heard, and, and what I was concerned about was shoring, you know, collapsing, the, the walls caving in. And they laughed at me, and they laughed at me, and I was told, hey, don't be trying to incorporate, and I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody, but this is, this is word for word, is what they told me was, don't be trying to incorporate the white man's ways into our methods. This is the way we've always done it. You know, that, that's the way it is. You know, one would have to understand being forced to survive in the modern world. Old ways are modified to be productive in profit efforts versus what they were truly initially designed for. And then I talked with my girls, one, just one little bit more, because I, I was curious. I've been trying to get Team Parada involved, and they're a little bit gun shy. They're, they're getting camera shy on me, and I, I don't know if it's a girl thing. I think it is at that teenage, you know, you, you only want to talk when... Certain, certain conditions, certain places, certain things, and I just can't get them fully on board yet, but I'm, I'm pushing, I'm still pushing. But when I talk to them, and I ask them, walking around our house, how are we being resilient? What is adaptation to you? And the first thing they said is, Grandpa, we moved to the desert, you brought us here to the corner of hell, you know, and all we can do is hide in the cave all day. And, <laughs> and that's, that's an adaptation measure, measure, really it is, avoiding the heat, avoiding the heat illness, you know, and everything like that. So, you know, they, we hide out. It, it's kind of hard. It's, it's really there, especially during the COVID. COVID was kind of easy for us because this is something we do all summer. Um, we went out back, and, and it, I'm sure Shasta has seen my pictures of my really shabby garden. Uh, it grows pretty good sometimes. It's pretty wild. It's, it, it's hard. Growing in the desert was difficult for me. And my flowers would come out, the bees would come around, and all of a sudden there would be no flowers, and the heat killed everything. So we put up a trampoline. We took the trampoline apart, just the, just the bouncy, the, the, the pad part that you jump on. We left the frame and the net, and that was our shade and our protection for our garden. So in order to be resilient and adapt so our garden could try and be somewhat effective, that's what we used. Hey, we're from the res, you know, we, we can't go out and buy all the nice things to make it look pretty. So we, 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 we cope, we deal, you know, we do what we have to do. Sun facing walls, you know, they said, hey, Grandpa, can you put up some shade so we don't have to spray the walls to keep the house cool? Wonderful idea. I put up, you know, a green, a green tarp to make shade on the wall so it's not baking when the sun comes around all day. Windows, old ways, dark curtains, double layers. Uh, we used to use aluminum foil, but now they make really nice blankets, um, and we like the native prints. Sunblock, you know, everybody uses this nice spray and everything else, and man, you can taste that when people are spraying it next to you. I I'm still an old guy. Uh, I, <laughs> I, I like using the wet mud or the sand, you know, or we cover with thin, breathable layers. Um, I I'm just not a, a fan of spraying with all that stuff. So that's adaptation to me. I'm going to go next, Jasta. <laughs> so you don't take everything I have to say. Um, and I, yeah. What John has said um, 
it's themes that I was thinking of, um, which relate, re, ad, relate to adaptation being about making adjustments. And sometimes those are just little adjustments. Sometimes they, they're building on things that you've been doing for a long time and you just shift a little bit. Um, and so I come at this, you know, from the perspective of somebody who is working for a tribe in a, as a planner. So planning to a large extent is about making those small adjustments and about adapting. And the way we're handling adaptation from this employee side of things is by looking at what's coming um, through climate vulnerability assessments and then thinking about how do we more effectively address what lies ahead by making some, some little adjustments. So we know we have roads that are not in great condition right now necessarily. What is gonna be the impact of, those, of climate change on those roads? And then how do we make little adjustments like larger culverts to handle heavier rainfall? And how do we get those particular adjustments made within the political and jurisdictional environment in which we work. For example, the roads don't all belong to the tribe. And so how do we nudge things a little bit and adapt in that way? How are we going to build on existing programs within community health and wellness um, for diabetes? And, you know, diabetes can be affected adversely by increasing temperatures. So how do we enhance the educational programs and the fitness programs to make it more relevant now and also more, av more available even, you know, as temperatures go up so that, that people can stay healthy. On the natural resources side, um, you know, how are we going to handle changes in in plants and in wildlife um, and, and what kinds of adaptations need to be made for that? What kind of adaptations need to be made for livestock? We're already looking at wildlife drinkers and additional water sources for livestock. How do we just push that a little bit more? How do we push the improvements to irrigation systems to cope with the increased likelihood of severe drought? Um, so adaptation is not a complete overhaul of what the community has always viewed as its needs and its goals in keeping with the traditions and the, the values in the community. But it is a way of reframing and putting them in a new perspective and maybe shifting the priorities and elevating certain things a little bit more to address what's coming. Well, those are some great responses. So I, I don't want to add too much other than to say that I, I agree. Um, and uh, you know, so I, I think what adaptation looks like is also going to be different depending on every community, whether that's a tribal community or uh, an inner city community or you know even a a wealthy community at the top of a hill. You know, those adaptations are going to to differ and looking at the just the diversity of tribal communities and tribal nations that we have in the United States I think about that a lot because my focus is on what's going to happen in Southern California you know, and in the Southwest so heat and drought and you know that sort of thing I don't put a lot of thought into melting ice and sea level rise for example uh, but nevertheless circling back to my, my answer about, about community, to me, adaptation also looks like extending your caring and your strategies and your resilience to communities that are experiencing different types of impacts than you may be dealing with yourself. So we need to have, I think, adaptation that just incorporates that sense of, of the world. And so even though we may not be worrying about the river's not freezing over and being trapped because we can't travel on the ice or our home sinking into the permafrost. If things like that are affecting our brothers and sisters in the polar regions, you know, in Alaska and, and the north of Canada, then, you know, that has an effect on all of us. So let's adapt by doing the best we can to live in a way that is 
obviously specific to the the issues that we're dealing with, and that's not just in Paula, but throughout Southern California. Uh, but let's make sure that what we do is not going to worsen the impacts for people who are living in other parts of the world. So I would like to think that some of the specific things that we've done in Paula, like installing more solar and replacing some of our dirty diesel engines in our fleet, those greenhouse gas emissions reduction strategies, maybe that makes just an infinitesimal bit of difference, but maybe that keeps that permafrost frozen just a little bit longer for people who aren't right here that I see every day. And I work across the country with federal, academic, state, and mostly tribal partners on climate change adaptation. And I absolutely love my work because it takes me to different places where I speak with community members about how climate change is affecting them personally and professionally. And for me, the two are no different when it comes to how tribes are feeling about climate change and how they are being impacted. Um, because we have been talking about resiliency for a long time, you know, when it came to the Trail of Tears, the long walk, etc. Tribes were, we were already defining what it means to be resilient. When you look in the dictionary, resilient it means the ability for one to bounce back after a traumatic event. And for us, resiliency back home where I'm from, in Shanto and Blue Gap, that often means perhaps downsizing the livestock so you conserve water resources um, more efficiently. But maintaining a small flock of sheep or uh, goats because that's one of our main forms of uh, uh, sustenance. And also saving more of the heritage um, corn that's been passed on through the different generations of Navajo families raising corn to eat, uh, but also to trade and share with our family members. Um, so that gives me hope because we're not giving up. Um, and we're finding more and more creative ways to be uh, self-sufficient while maintaining cultural connections to what our ancestors uh, survived and fought for. Um, so there's a lot of examples that um, I, can, I can tell you stories about it, about, about it all day long, about what cultural resi resiliency and hope means. Um, but that really does, is, it's what keeps me inspired because that's how I was raised um, on the Navajo Nation, the Nebikeya, uh growing up without running water um, or electricity and having to go out and find water and proper feed for the livestock. Um, but also just the sheer determination of many of my friends in the field, whether, it, whether they're working for tribes or working with tribes, on climate change resiliency, on the different hazards that are continually threatening their, um, their land and their animals, but also their spirituality. At Campo, so, where I'm working, uh, one of the things that is, uh, is, has always been a threat, but is an increased threat with the climate changes that we're seeing, with the global warming that we're seeing, is um, wildfire danger. And so we have, um, the tribe has adapted m many different ways of, of trying to address uh, wildfire uh, threats to the to the reservation, to the community, and, and in the broader community as well. Things like developing their uh, uh, tribal emergency response. Campo is one of, of uh, several tribes in the area that has a full-time um, fire department. So the things that we're doing in my department, in the Campo Environmental uh, Protection Department, is um, looking at ways for uh, reestablishing the, uh, the forest that we have, the um, oak trees are a mainstay for the Kumeyaay culture. And we have been inundated with a, uh, with a pest. Uh, it's, a, it's called the gold-spotted oak borer, or GSOP. And uh, trying to assess the damage that those oak borers have been doing to the uh, oak trees, trying to determine if it's uh, because of the drought 
or if it's one of those uh, invasive kinds of things where the, the pests are coming in because, because of the transportation uh, routes that go through the reservation. We're right up the interstate uh, near the border of, of Mexico. So there are a lot of different ways that that, that, that uh, borer, which is a natural uh, um, part of the environment, is invading and, and killing trees. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, really, um, it's really devastating. And particularly for a culture that has uh, the oak tree, the acorns, as, as an integral part of their culture, uh, trying to address that by creating a nursery, by um, collecting acorns and, and doing the things that we need to do to adapt for, with a, a native plant nursery. That's, uh, and, and that's thrilling to me because, uh, because that's part of uh, the history of who I am. We were, we were definitely agriculturalists. And, um, and, and so it's, it, it's, it's slow, um, but, it's, but it's, that's the good work that we do. So where I'm at currently up in the, on the White Mountain Apache Reservation in Arizona, one thing that I've noticed that really affects my community is like each year we have a water shortage and we have like a, a main aquifer that we get all our water from. <clears throat> and each year it's refilled with the monsoon rains and with the, the snowpack. But each year both of those like come at different times now or there's less. And mm -hmm. so that water shortage is like impacting our community a lot more and a lot sooner because it usually happens like April through June is when the shortage kind of happens and like it's becoming more severe. And another thing that affects our community also is like the wildfires. And <clears throat> each year we do have our wildfires and we've done like many burnings and more people are becoming more, more welcome to the burnings, to the, to allow that to happen. <clears throat> but every now and then, like someone will not like the smoke or something like that. And, but the more they're educated about these things, like they're more welcome to it. And like, they know that it's something that needs to be taking place in the forest because that's where it belongs. That's where it needs to happen to to keep our forest to keep our forest healthy in the future. So, um, as far as looking at what tribal adaptation looks like, I know we're rounding out our adaptation plan here shortly. Um, and really, I think a part of adaptation is understanding what the vulnerabilities of your community are and identifying the proper way in prioritizing a ranking. And I know a lot of times we don't want to say that because within our tribal communities, everything's a priority, you know, everything's vulnerable. So really, again, looking at it through, through that contextual lens of not only just Western science, but our local indigenous ways that we view the world and even our own epistemologies and making that really work, if, again, kind of symbiotically, because I've come to find out that it, we are doing adaptation. It's just because it's not maybe in that sector of climate change, it's not really being counted. I mean, we have a project going off for rehabilitation of homes within the village and the village in Santa Domingo is a part of the National Register for Historic Places and Properties. You know, so really trying to address that because of a severe storm, monsoonal storm that came through in 2014 that really wreaked a lot of havoc on, you know, the older, the older, if you will, built infrastructure of, of, of Santa Domingo where it's created some other issues such as mold and things of that nature. And knowing if you have asthma and other health conditions, you know, that sets it off in a whole different aspect. So really um, looking at these adaptive measures and how do we implement management strategies and techniques to really identify how these measures or these strategies are working within our community and what we need to do to assess that they're being successful. And another example to this would be last year we uh, reforested 10,000 Douglas fir within a 1950s burn scar up in our Timberland area of Santa Domingo Reservation. And we've been monitoring them and unfortunately just, you know, we've got to understand, you know, the right altitude and climate for Douglas fir versus maybe juniper pinion that would be more successful or pine that would actually have a higher succession rate 
for planting, but we were able to at least have about a 49% rate with succession of those Douglas fir. And this year we're getting ready to plant 8,000 trees. I think it's like 45,000 Douglas fir, 4,500 Douglas fir, 25 white fir, and 1,000 pine. And so as we're working with organizations such as Trees, Water, and People out of Fort Collins, Colorado, to do these restoration projects, this is what adaptation looks like to me within my community in Santa Domingo, because we're trying to, if you will, recreate a healthy forest, given that, you know, we know the impacts of wildfire, as Corwin mentioned, and as well as Lisa mentioned, you know, and understanding that those do have an effect, not just within our forest, but within the watershed, because here in New Mexico, we have such poor soil quality and because we lack a lot of vegetation to stabilize the soil when it, you know, when the fires come through and wreak havoc, then the monsoons come <laughs> and wreaks more havoc. You know, you get a lot of sediment that flows down into the Rio Grande and could potentially cause fish kills. So if you're culturally connected to say, New Mexico trout, brown trout or whatever trout might be in the Rio Grande, and you have a high fish kill that year because of wildfire, because of increase in monsoonal activity, then, you know, you're losing a cultural subsistence right there. So for, for us, you know, we're always constantly looking at what we can do to develop working relationships and partnerships here in New Mexico, the Forest Service, for the, the U.S. Forest Service, as well as the New Mexico Environment Department's Forestry Division, we're looking at this concept of shared stewardship and what does that really mean to all of us across the state. And we have what's called reserve treaty rights land programs from BIA, which allows our forestry crews to do forestry projects in our Aboriginal and ancestral territory. So I'm like, well, you know what? The whole Southwest is our Aboriginal territory. <laughs> so guess what? We're going all over here. So part of my job and my relationship that I've been doing with the Forest Service and their various ranger districts is establishing that working relationship so we can all work together to identify adaptive techniques and strategies and overall management of our forest systems because we know wildfire knows no boundaries. So the more we're able to identify these working relationships to do adaptive measures um, as far as forestry work, you know, even looking at, you know, re rebuilding homes or creating that, that atmosphere where we're educating our people on what it all means so that way they feel it and they see it versus trying to read it, I think is really what I'm striving for that adaptation to look like and even beyond adaptation because I want us to become resilient and to be able to bounce back after certain events and, and events that happen to our community that impact us detrimentally versus being okay, well, 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 we can't just move over here anymore, but you know, again, really, really being methodical in our approach to not only adaptation, but resiliency. So, uh, you know, in this journey as tribal climate um, professionals and um, working in indigenous communities, and you know, there's a lot to be thankful for but I also wanted to touch on today of, um, you know, as you go through um, your work, the projects you're working on, um, the staff you're working with, um, the communities you're working with, um, what keeps you going and, and inspired um, to move forward um, each day in the projects that you're working on and the programs that you're working with um, in, in tribal climate adaptation? For me, what keeps me going is just the, the recognition that the two biggest issues of our time right now are climate and equity. Um, and if I wasn't working on these issues, I don't think I would be satisfied with myself um, and with how I'm putting my life to use for the, the greater good, really. Um, so that's, that's what really is driving me in this work um, is the sense that it does make a difference and that it mostly that it is really important. I'm, you know, I can't be sure every day that everything I do makes a difference. I like to, to think that's the case, um, but I know that that is what I'm trying to do. And I think these are the, the issues that really need the, um, need everyone's effort at this point. We all need to be behind this work. 
And when I say, um, you know, climate and equity, I think that the two are inextricably linked and that's very clear in working with the tribal community. Um, tribes are going to be hit harder and in unique ways from climate change because of the, the relationship to and responsibilities um, with the, the more than human world. And so it is an equity issue, climate change, um, and that's, that's where I need to put my ability and time. All right, John, I'm going to take the next slot. <laughs> um, my friends, the ones that are on this call right now, uh, the ones that are not here, at least in, in, well, in virtual person, but who I know I can count on, my colleagues, um, the people that I've met and the relationships that I've developed through doing this work mean more to me than almost any other relationships I've formed. And you know, that means that's, that's both professionally and personally, because I know now I have somebody to reach out to. And so it's an inspiration to me, but it's also a, a place to land because so many people are not doing what we are doing, but we're doing it for them. And that is not always a comfortable place to be. So I have to inspire myself by looking at the work that my not just my colleagues, but my friends are doing. And, you know, John, say what you want about what I'm going to say next, but it also is inspirational to me that so much of this work is done by women. Women seem to be in this space, you know, so much more than in a lot of the other places where, where work needs to be done. So actually, John, that makes me even more grateful uh, to the men like you who are in there with us uh, but I, I, I am inspired by the work of women, and I'm inspired by the work of indigenous people. I'm inspired by the work of those who have every reason to turn their backs on the, the white world, the, the colonizers, and say, you know what, why should we help you? And yet, here you are. So that is a continuing inspiration to me, and I am humbled by it. Nice, Asta. I can agree with that. Yeah, I really, honestly, I can. Because be, being a man, it, hey, being a man in a man's world where it can't be run without a woman, you know, it, 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 it's wild. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and something I've always pushed for, I've been in this quite a long time. And, and I've always pushed, I've noticed, I have to agree with you, Shasta. You know, I went through many employees. And the women, the female employees, not, not to slam them in, they seem to be so efficient, so productive, so willing to give. You know, it, it, it is. It's great. And uh, props, props to the women in the program. Yes. Um, we couldn't do it without you all. Really, we couldn't. Um, <laughs> for me, what keeps me going? Tacos, coffee, and cheeseburgers. <laughs> I, I figured I'd start with that because this, this, this topic right here is going to be a little touchy. And... Um, for me, as we all know, I have 15 grandkids. They are my inspiration. You know, even if I can't see them or be close to all of them, I love every one of them, and I have hopes for their future. You know, I, I hope things can be better for them than they are for us or were for us. That's something we've all always pushed for. Even our parents push that on us when we're young. You know, my kids who left are my biggest inspiration. I've lost three kids. Two of them were from La Posta, and man, they took pride in their reservation. Let me recover here. I apologize. You know, Terrence and Jessica, they were really into protecting and enhancing the environment on their reservation, and I looked up to them. So I keep going. You know, my son David left me two twins, which I still have. I'm raising and I hope they're productive. You know, they, they've learned a lot. They've been tailing along with me everywhere I go, which is something I've done with all my kids. If you've known me as long as I've been in it, even my daughters would travel with me in the beginning 20 years ago. And with that, you know, uh, I'll just quote my daughter's Earth Day theme. You know, 
we must aspire to inspire before we expire. And that's it. I mean, that's what keeps me going, the kids. Well, um, I think in my journey, uh, if, if I get emotional, don't pay attention to me. <laughs> Climate change <laughs> makes me emotional. Um, in this journey, I think what keeps me going and, and inspired is all of you. Um, it's the colleagues that I've met, the peers I've met, the friends I've met, you know, the community members that I've met, the youth, everybody that has pretty much crossed my path in this journey of understanding climate change and what we need to know to be able to not only convey the information to, you know, our community members, but, you know, to our leadership. So our leadership understands because our leadership here in New Mexico, if you're not familiar with the most familiar with it, most of the Pueblos, I think with the exception of three, have a traditional form of appointment. So every every year we get a new governor, sometimes it's a re repeat governor, but most of the times it's a new governor every year. So in December, as the current governor is going out and then they're getting ready for the new governor coming in, you know, we have to prepare all the information that we need, that we feel necessary is imperative to informing the incoming governor on all the work that we do. And then a lot of times, you know, sometimes it, it lags in that support because it, it, it's a lot to learn. It, it's really a lot to learn. And so just trying to find new ways of delivering the information through technology, as mentioned, you know, working on the digital story. And now that I'm almost done, you know, even sharing that with my leadership and my um, colleagues at Santa Domingo Pueblo and beyond, because I think it's part of what helps us tell our story as we're working to not only address these climatic changes that we're feeling, but to ultimately ensure that we're not creating an atmosphere or environment of doom or gloom, but that we're we're, we're properly informing our community members of what we need to know in order to better prepare ourselves. Now, if this is through low cost to no cost mitigation efforts, for example, you know, doing uh, seasonal checks on your home as winter approaches, making sure that, you know, all your heating ducts are clean or that your chimney's cleaned out or your heater's working or even moving into the springtime and making sure that, you know, if you do have air conditioning and you have an elderly in your house that you're making sure that that elder will be comfortable for if we see an increase in temperature during the summers because that's what the projections tell us. So I think, you know, as I, I continue to delve into climate change and all the aspects in which it impacts within not just Santa Domingo, but my life here in New Mexico, you know, really learning from everybody that I've been fortunate enough to meet along this path, um, even those that I don't know that are, you know, starting to get in touch with me as well, you know, it, it's really inspiring just to see the collective work that we can do together. And just imagine if the whole world was like that, what we could really achieve together without looking at color, without looking at, you know, these imaginary boundaries that separate reservation from county, from state, you know, and things of that nature. Because I definitely feel that that sometimes pits us against each other versus being able to break down those barriers to, to work together. And one of the things I'm trying to do here in New Mexico, not just through um, the Mexico Tribal Resiliency Action Network, but through my own work in Santa Domingo Pueblo is, for the lack of better word, infiltrate Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham's Climate Task Force, because I don't think there's any Native representation on that task force. And, you know, we as Pueblos and tribes here in New Mexico, you know, we exist just as much as everybody else within the state. So why aren't we trying to, again, break down those barriers to over overcome these challenges when addressing flooding, when addressing wildfire, when addressing drought, or even the health conditions and disparities that we're feeling from a global pandemic? You know, why don't, why can't we work smarter by working together versus working harder and not being inclusive across the board and really just just defining that that pathway again not just for us that are here today um, but for the next seven generations to come and again really looking at that that perspective of how do we be a good ancestor and what can we do to be a part of the process versus not and I always look at myself as being a solution seeker and problem solver so with that, it's really trying to make those connections to be able to do the work that I do because I can't do this alone. 
Um, for me, <clears throat> I think about like the journey I started with like in school, like I've heard about climate change so much in classes and like that's like just what it was at that moment is just like understanding what someone is telling me about climate change. But then coming back home, like you really can start seeing like some of the changes like I mentioned before, like the our monsoon season seems to be coming later on. Our snow packs are smaller and smaller each year. <clears throat> It's interesting and sad to see those changes firsthand. And that's like something for me that keeps me going, like especially starting with my internship this summer. Like it's really helped me to understand all of this more, <clears throat> especially working with new individuals, people I've never heard of, and like different organizations like these are very passionate people about climate change and I'm just starting my working journey and it helps and and is very inspiring to see all this and that's how that's where my journey has been taking me so far so my inspiration <clears throat> is my grandchildren and my grandparents because I'm still here. And one of the things I've always uh, tried to instill in my children in particular, but also my grandchildren is, we're here because of the sacrifices that others made. There were many, many Pawnee people who died, many, many Comanche people who died. And that's resilience and that's strength because we are still here. I am still here. And so, and so it's, it's, uh, it's incumbent on each and every one of us to continue to live the life that our ancestors made sure that we were able to have. And, uh, and I'm inspired by those that went before me and those who will come after me. I've got beautiful grandchildren from Oklahoma to New Mexico that are my inspiration, my love, my heart. And um, I, uh, I think the other thing that I wanted to make sure uh, was mentioned here is that we're, we're living through this COVID-19 pandemic um, and uh, and that's inspiring in a certain way because being the age that I am and and having watched uh, our politicians and powers that be not pay attention to this climate change and global warming issues here we are in this pandemic which was absolutely discussed that this is the kind of thing that would happen and so it's, it, it can't be a mystery anymore. It will not be a mystery. There's no, um, there's no denying any, any longer. Um, and, uh, and, and so I'm encouraged by that, even though I, I also watch these yahoos uh, that, 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 that are still wanting to be denying. They're denying that there's a pandemic for gosh sakes. And, 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 uh, and, and so that eggs me on too. <laughs> Um, so uh, the last um, question or reflection I wanted to um, end today's discussion with um, is your advice on engaging and working with tribes um, in the Southwest, nationally, in California, um, you know, whatever that may be, but your advice on engaging and working with tribes and building those relationships, building community, um, building co um, climate hope, um, it, with the inclusion of tribes, the integration of tribes, um, and that tribes aren't the afterthought. Um, sorry about that. Um, but yes, your advice on engaging with tribes. I'll leave. <laughs> engaging and working with tribes or natives, you know, cons consider that lifestyles may appear to be different. Customs, beliefs, traditions, and culture must be respected when addressed by a tribal representative. You know, whether they're native or the tribal representative that that tribe has assigned, everyone must be respectful. We could take an approach of, it, well, not we, but as other agencies come forward to meet with native groups, even myself, you know, I, you do. You have to take the approach of what can we do together? Avoid the term, we can make you better. Take the time to listen to the knowledgeable ones. 
Request permission to use the materials and information. Do not release or share without the consent of each unique tribe that you have requested traditional or cultural information to use. And that's kind of where I'll leave that. I'll let Justin have the last word. Um, and this is something that, that we have been talking about is getting a basic understanding and doing your homework on tribes, um, on their sovereignty, on their, their federally recognized status or not, in some cases, um, on their land jurisdiction. Um, just having that basic understanding and, and groundwork and recognition and respect for that is an important foundation for any work with tribes. Um, the, the things that John, you know, mentions and things that are more on the, the cultural side, that comes over time. But if you show up to work with the tribal government and don't have even the, the basic foundation that you can get by doing a little bit of homework, um, that puts you at a disadvantage for understanding the, the framework in which you are wanting to, to work and collaborate. Um, so I think that's, that's a key preliminary step. It's definitely not everything you need to do, but it's something that it's really important to, to be aware of just as a, a preliminary. Um, also, just to add to that, don't assume everything that you read is accurate or correct. A lot of things written about tribes um, are not entirely correct. Um, so do your homework, but also be prepared to be corrected on some things. Yeah, um, John provides a perfect list and, and Sharon, that's a, a great you know, coda to that, um, to which I will only add that uh, you need to have a thick skin, develop a thick skin and I, in my, my 15 plus years now of working in Paula, actually 20 if you include when I was working here as a volunteer, uh, I've seen people come and go. And the ones who go quickly are generally the ones who are not prepared for the unique experience of working in a tribal community and haven't done their homework and haven't let tribes take the lead and who have centered and prioritize their own education uh, or their own experience, which is not the same as the education and experience that you get from the people you're working with in, in those communities. Now, when it's, when it's consultants or government agencies, they're able to get away with it because they come in, they do their thing and they go. But if you really wanna make a long-term difference in a tribe um, or with a tribe in a tribal community, develop that thick skin, shut up and listen. Uh, I saw, so I keep seeing this recently, you know, they say we have uh, two ears and one mouth for a reason. So use those, which I need to take that advice myself. I think I have like 10 mouths because I can never shut up, but uh, there's, there's, there's a reason that you just need to listen. And then just the final thing about that is that if you're working with multiple tribes, don't think that because you've worked with Paula, you know how to work with Rincon. And because you've worked with Rincon, you know how to work with Augustine. And because you've worked in California, you know how to work in New Mexico or Arizona. You don't. So remember, every single tribe is unique. And that's all I would add to uh, already a great list of, of tips and tricks for surviving working in a tribal community. <laughs> I'll go ahead and go first. I think for me, um, especially, you know, I've completed my sixth year anniversary at Santa Domingo on Tuesday, I think. And it's crazy to think that I've been here that long and especially only working for one place. <laughs> I was all like, wow, that's the longest. But I, I think for me, and especially understanding how it works within Santa Domingo as far as, you know, the traditional leadership, the church leadership, you know, my role as not only a woman within the Pueblo, but a non-tribal member within their Pueblo is really understanding patience. You know, patience, I think, is definitely key to a lot of this work because we don't move as quickly as some of our non 
tribal partners that are out there, you know. And so for me, I always make sure that, you know, when I'm engaging in, if, if, if an outside organization wants me, tribal or non-tribal, wants me to participate or engage in a project or an endeavor that they're, they're seeking, then I always ask that, you know, not only be patient, but, you know, to give, give time for me to be able to secure approval from my governor if I need to have that approval to, to, to do some of the work with them. But more so just, just making sure that, you know, they're being inclusive at the beginning versus at the 11th hour, because sometimes that's what happens to me is the last minute they're all, oh, Cynthia Naha, let's call Cynthia and see if she can be a part of it. And I have a hard time saying no. So, <laughs> you know, I really try to, you know, work, to a depth and degree where if, if we can be inclusive and engaging in the beginning of a project or whatever endeavor it may be, then that's really where that relationship building should start. Because a lot of times, you know, because of how we were treated as Native people here in the, in the United States and just knowing federal Indian law and policy, you know, it sometimes it takes a minute before we jump on that wagon a trust with this federal agency, you know, so, you know, really just making sure that, you know, the trust is there because that's all a part of building these partnerships, you know, and really working to an, to, to the full extent of engagement in what, whatever aspect we're looking at, whether it's climate change or whether it's looking at, you know, restoration projects or home re rehabilitation or even going down to like the community garden and our annual feast days. So really I think, you know, it, it, it's being respectful, being mindful that we don't operate off of the same, so to speak, calendar as our non-tribal partners do. And just ultimately being, being mindful of the context in which you're approaching us at. And then of course, not, not being afraid to come and talk with us, you know, so I think sometimes, sometimes people don't know who to go to. So they go to several different people before they finally get, so to speak, in touch with the right person. But, you know, it, it's, I don't know, I guess that, that's pretty much the advice I would have is, I don't know that, and I don't know if it made sense, but. <laughs> One thing that I've noticed like throughout school is um, like the lack of like the Western institutions like really talking about tribes and like their natural resources and how to work with them like in a way like I've had to I've had a previous internship and so <clears throat> it's like I really have to learn as I go <clears throat> and one thing like students need to recognize is like to really listen like especially to like uh, your supervisors and other students even like <clears throat> learning learning as you go because that's definitely what I've been doing <clears throat> and I've been learning a lot and especially from the inspiring individuals I talked about earlier and that'll like allow like uh, relationships to build in the future establishing those relationships and <clears throat> and yeah that's like some of the main things I've I had to learn myself. Thank you. So for me, I think that um, the that I would like our, our partners or potential partners out there to understand is that working with tribes is very um, difficult and uh, trust building is uh, is um, it, it takes time and and patience. Um, um, and and that's uh, that's absolutely right for what Cynthia had said. Um, it uh, because so many of us have such limited resources, and we have to pay attention to the thing that comes up uh, 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 right in front of us each each and every day. But also, we have things that come up in front of our leadership that come up each and every day. So our stuff, our priorities, our work with some. Uh, uh, community groups and organizations always has to take uh, has to be behind what uh, tribal leadership would have us working on that being said tribal leadership also encourages us to uh, find the uh, the tools uh, within the community organizations and those that would help us 
um, and not harm us and not uh, uh, um, uh, trip us up in the kinds of things that we need to do. It's a, it's a, um, it's a dance and sometimes, sometimes it's just, we, we just can't dance. But um, real quickly, I want to give a shout out to somebody who I admire a great deal and, and has recently won the awards too, and that's uh, Amber Paris with the Climate Science Alliance. She is magnificent in, and, she's, <laughs> and she'll keep coming at you, which is uh, one of those wonderful things about Amber is she, uh, she courted Campo for a year and a half to come get on, come work with us, them do this uh, climate science stuff with us. And because I'm all, you know, an old curmudgeon about this whole situation, for her to be able to pull me in and, and, and to keep trying to pull me in was, it was really quite remarkable. And, uh, and so, yay, Amber Paris, uh, I love you. She, she knows that, so it's, it's, it's no surprise. But, um, but also, I have come to appreciate the other, the tribal officials that I work with. There's uh, Dr. Shasta Gon. There's um, uh, Cindy Smallwood at Humul, and just tons and tons of others. Uh, uh, Mr. Norte at, at um, Mesa Grande, they're gonna kill me. Would see, there's so many tribes in, the, in, in San Diego County. I can name all 19 Pueblos, but not all the 22 <laughs> tribes in Southern California. But anyways, and, but, it, but I will. I'm just getting old, that's all. They, they give me a little bit of a break because I'm old and you know the brain cells aren't working quite like they used to. But, but um, uh, developing trust, taking the time, and, and being relevant is the whole, is it, it, in my opinion, being relevant. Talk about uh, the kinds of things that, that a group is, is working on, things like uh, uh, reforestation and, you know, and, and trying to address mining mitigation or, or potential mining mitigation, like what White Mountain is having to face, which is just, there's just incredible things still going on that we, we get to talk with each other and pass these things around and we get to know with each other and support each other. And that's, that's how you get to be old and still working in this stuff like me. So my one advice that I would give you, if you're wanting to work with tribes is to always respect that that is their information that they share with you, but also that the, it's not hearsay. The information that they share with you is not hearsay. It is true data, observational data, experience data that has been passed through generation, observed and documented through word of mouth, oral histories, um, and respect that about them. Uh, that's a big part of, I think, what makes our work at ITEP so successful is that we integrate that into our work. Um, and no tribe is the same. No two tribes are the same. You know, we're all similar in very many ways. We're very different in a lot of ways, not just regionally or landscape-wise, but we have a lot of um, similarities. And one of those is that we have to maintain our resiliency against climate change, but also the non-climatic factors that st uh, stress us out uh, politically but also uh, environmentally so we are all in this together and we must all remain uh, resilient and work and work together um, I hope I gave some little piece of advice that you um, can take with your work all right so um, before we wrap up is there any last thoughts um you wanted to leave us with before we go? Um, I'll just say that it's it's great to have this conversation and I, I wish we could have been having it in person, but regardless of that, I, I hope that some of the experiences that we've been able to share are helpful to the people who are watching this. And I'm always happy to talk to people one-on-one, uh, -on -one, so feel free to shoot me an email if you want some help or you know, want to hear what my favorite ice cream flavor is. You know, now John talked about his tacos and, and burgers, and I'm like, oh, stomach <laughs> growling. <laughs> so, and and just just you know, keep keep up, keep the hope. You know, if we keep working together, then there's there's always hope. Where do you see my presentation for the summit? <laughs> Where do you see my presentation? The hope is gonna it's gonna build even stronger. I'm hoping. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I really, I am. Um, <laughs> I believe it. And thank you. Thank you all for including me because, man, I, I, I don't want to say I'm honored, but, man, I am so pleased to be a part of this. And, you know, it, it, you just don't know what it is to be, be able to contribute what, I, you know, what, what we know and what we can share. Um, I appreciate that. I enjoy it. I'd just like to thank you, Althea, for the opportunity to be here today and to be a part of the panel. I, I really look forward to these opportunities, and especially in this new setting, you know, to, to be able to still communicate and coordinate, you know, presentations, panels, and workshops, and all of that good stuff virtually and still keep ourselves moving forward because I think that's also a part of climate hope and everything that we're doing is making sure that we're engaging and that our engagement is meaningful. So thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. That's right. I think uh, this is this doing this, what you're doing out there is a resilient strategy and the fact that we get to do it and have the tools and the capability to do it is is um is awesome because they realize that there are those who don't have the capacity and and so and so it's important for us to step up because we can yeah thank you for this opportunity to be a part of this panel today i've i've learned a lot just like lear listening from the each of you and like it's like information that i'll instill and hopefully be able to use in the future as well so thank you we're counting on you, fella. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are just uh, making sure you're prepared to take over when, when we're done, so. <laughs> um, but thank you to the, each of you. I greatly appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. Um, it's always great to see your faces and you inspire me in the work that you're doing. So um, until we see each other again, whether virtually or in person, um, take care. Yeah, Althea, it's great to see you too. You're an inspiration. Thanks. Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, guys. I appreciate all, right. all of you. Have a good day and stay safe. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye.